drawing on the theme of femininity and war, um, and the First World War in particular, I'm going to look now at um, how the effects of war had on gender and how these were represented in um, visual imagery, um, mainly fine art, which is paintings, drawing and sculpture, um, and how this actually had an effect on the long-term way in which the canon of art history has been remembered for the First World War. Um, Basically, very little has been written very recently in the art historical scho scholarship about the home front perspective in art. Um, my doctoral thesis and that of other people more recently, but namely James Fox, who we'll all know from the television, um, and also Grace Brockington at Bristol University, um, have sort of set out to find out why sort of virtually all the art historical scholarship since the First World War up until the present day talks about the masculine perspective on the, the battlefront. Um, I would like to suggest that part of this reason is due to the impact of the effect circumstances of war on concepts of femininity. Um, and I'm going to show this how it's affected paintings and how they might have been received and how they might subsequently have been written out of art history as a result. Okay, so I'm going to examine how gender is constructed in a selection of examples of visual imagery ranging from magazine covers to paintings and a number of artistic expressions ranging from examples of modernist work by somebody like Christopher Richard Wynne Nevinson um, to more naturalistic responses to the war by people like John Charles Dolman. Um, paper's going to reveal it as a result of either deliberate action or... Um, unintentional oscillation between sign and referent. Um, to a greater or lesser extent, each work reveals the disa dis sorry, disa dis destabilizing effects of war on long-held social customs um, around, based around concepts of gender, particularly those pertaining to femininity. And also how this was not only encouraged but shaped and promoted by visual imagery during the First World War. Okay, right, so we're going to go back a little bit further here. Within traditional structuring of most human societies, emphasis placed on childbirth um, was the primary determinant of assigning wartime roles. This meant that women were relegated almost exclusively to the domestic sphere, thereby allowing feminists to become extricably linked or associated with passivity, weakness and domesticity. Um, drawing on this, Joyce Berkman has argued that following similar premise within early 20th century British society, women as potential and actual mothers enjoyed reproductive power at the expense of physical and intellectual prowess. As mothers, they argue belonged in the home away from the hurly-burly of the marketplace, no less the battlefield. Therefore, as Nancy Houston has argued, um, war and sexual difference could be seen as reciprocal definers of each other, whereby the laudable, exclusively female act of withstanding pain in labour and childbirth finds equal only in the valiant fortitude in the fa face of battle of men. On this basis, women are often taught that motherhood can make women of them, whilst boys are often taught that it's war that makes men of them. Reflecting the rigid structuring of British society on the basis of sexual difference, um, sexual difference in the terms that I'm using them here in, and in the context that they should generally be understood, basically sexual difference, the difference between sexual difference and gender is sexual difference is a biological thing. Gender is always a social construct, essentially. So that's the basis in which I'm using the two terms here today. Um, so reflecting this, um, women were legally prevented from fighting during the First World War. Additionally, before the impact of the massive male injury and death toll had been fully realised and had a chance to influence context, women were initially discouraged also from undertaking jobs left vacant by voluntary men. Um, that situation changed very quickly by the spring of 1915 when women were actively encouraged to um, take up jobs um, by an initiative led by um, Emmeline Pankhurst and David Lloyd George. Um, before the introduction of conscription in spring 1916, the predominant approach used by much British pro-war propaganda, um, be it official or unofficial, such as this um, cover from Modern Life, which had started its life off as a pro-masculine magazine to counter the sort of feminist um, rise of work of the suffrage movement as, as Modern Man, which changed its name during the war period to Modern Life and disappeared halfway through in the end. Um, to 
encourage men by using the link between war and sexual difference as a way to induce voluntary enlistment. Therefore, as an article in the Times of September 19, uh, 1914 by Banfield Fuller noticed, men were therefore urged to patriotic enlist to fight in order to protect nations and loved ones um, was a way to establish an individual's manliness and would be rewarded by revenge, glory and women's smiles. And here we have an example of that being seen here. The man who doesn't volunteer to go for war and isn't wearing khaki doesn't get the woman, whereas the big brave soldier does and runs off with the woman. Okay. Meanwhile, evoking a similar link between the roles of childbirth and war, and as a result suggesting that aggression in wartime was purely a masculine preoccupation, um, which is something that, although the women's suffrage campaign does gear down and abandon hostility during the war, women's suffrage still play on the idea that war is primarily a masculine thing on the basis of the reciprocal definition of war and gender. Um, the graphic on the 22nd of August 1914, an article entitled The Women's Attitude to War, informed readers that the primal woman is opposed to war because her mission in the eternal scheme of things is to produce life, not destroy it. Destructive is the male. However, such social customs and stereotyping of weak femininity and strong masculinity are only valid as long as they remain stable. And as Judith Butler's work on performativity of gender has reminded us, um, concepts of sex are not simple fact or static condition, um, but perpetually unstable and subject to constant re redefinition under particular circumstances um, and context. Supporting Butler's observation, no, during the British home front, the mass mobilisation of men into military service, injury and death, along with the need for supplies of munitions, led to large numbers of wounded men and seeming helpless men and large, alongside a, enlarged female employment and women associating roles of heads of the household. Also we see women taking on roles like this, the idea of the welder, which would have been a role that would never have been seen as feminist, feminine before the First World War. Um, and this is again supported in the, the, the official war art of of Nevinson here, which was an image that was um, created for British um, propaganda efforts and ideals scheme of prints that were published to show the efforts of war, for example, supporting the war, but the ideals for which war was also being fought. Um, the effect of this change was to raise the perceptions of expe expanded feminine authority alongside notions of masculine weakness. As a result, concepts of strong masculinity and weak femininity that had been prevalent in the pre-war period, temporarily for the duration of the war only, and this is important, underwent radical change, thus destabilising the pre-war tropic balance. To this end, the impact of war upon concepts of gender meant that women were seen as either passive and in need of male protection in line with long-held traditions of masculinity and femininity, or as more active agents who were instrumental in the massive death toll as a consequence of their role as prizes for voluntary enlistment by men in the work in productions of weapons that maimed and killed people and their involvement in the flawed practice of handing out white feathers to shame men into enlistment, which we'll come back to in a minute. Um, demonstrating how concepts of masculinity and femininity were constructed in certain paintings and helped to shape alternative perspectives and meanings and values is the imagery of the creditors by John Charles Dolman of 1915. Focal point of this painting is five figures seated on a bench which we believe is Hyde Park in London during the First World War. Four of the figures represent British servicemen, denoted as such by the type of uniforms worn, all of whom are seemingly afflicted by, afflicted by various injuries. Though not being any obvious sign of evidence of wounding or injury, such as slings or bandages, the first male figure, seated on the left, holds a walking stick, suggesting that he's unsteady on his feet or perhaps as a result of an injury or a disablement caused by war. Next to the male figure, um, is a female figure. Um, following the, next to this figure is a male figure with one sling in his arm who holds a cigarette in the other arm, whilst the third male figure, dressed in a military kilt for Scottish regiment, sits with a cap placed uh, uh, on over a bandage covering both his head and his eye. The fourth male figure, seated on the bench in the right foreground, possesses a leg in plaster and two wooden crutches. Seated beneath 
between the first two men, as I've said, is a female figure who is clearly dressed as a nurse. Whilst the depiction of these, both the male and figures in the painting can be understood to imply Dolman's painting might celebrate the work of men serving their country during the war, the disproportionately high number of injured masculine figures in the artwork can be seen to function to place greater emphasis on the male subjects, thereby suggesting that men, and in particular servicemen, are the primary focus. The injured demeanour of the male figures, thereby allowing the painting to allude to the massive injury and death toll of men. Furthermore, the men's injuries can be interpreted as suggesting that servicemen were more likely to suffer these injuries, thereby implying that death and injury in the First World War was a predominantly masculine experience. Um, therefore, as its title implied, the creditors can be understood to be a celebration. These men should have credit for their courage and sacrifice in order to convey the indebtedness felt by large sectors of British public towards such men for their selfless, courageous protection of the nation. Demonstrating the strength of public feeling um, for these, the, it's extol, it's succinctly expressed by a letter by Eva Isaacs, Marshness of Reading, who set up the women's unit of the IWM, in a letter to her husband in February 1917, which notes, having attended a social event, a blinded officer was there too. Poor chap, it makes one's heart ache to see him. I feel as if I was person in his debt for life. After all, it was for me and for all of us at home that he lost his sight, poor fellow. I feel much the same to all wounded, I see, towards anyone in khaki. They seem to have a tremendous hold on me. Nothing one can do is enough for them, one can never repay them. In common with other civilians, Dorman is likely to have been well aware of injured and disabled men from first-hand experience, and regular illustrated reports of men, such as in newspapers, for example, this photograph that was published in War Budget magazine um, of 1917 of a group of soldiers in military, uh, hospital blue uniforms with nurses in paint. And strength of focus um, alluding to masculine heroine in Dorma's painting therefore appears to render the female figure as merely an adjunct to the males. Nevertheless, although seemingly insignificant, in, in light of the destabilising effects of war upon concepts of gender, the inclusion of the female figure in the creditors can actually be understood to have had a very important function in how the overall composition of Dorman's painting might have been interpreted in relation to the context of war. In the painting, the figure shown holding the, the, the cigarette um, leans towards the female figure in a gesture indicating that he's waiting for her to light the cigarette with the match she holds in one hand which she is, is about to light against the matchbox which she holds in the other. The interaction of these two figures as a result of lighting the cigarette suggests that there is perhaps a flirtatious dimension between the couple. As a result, the painting can be understood to allude to sexual attraction as a mechanism to coerce men into voluntary enlistment, thereby perhaps drawing attention to notions of female complicity in the death and injury of such men. Moreover, the seeming innocuous action of lighting a cigarette also communicated that the male figure, because of his injuries, was unable to light his own cigarette. Consequently, the action of the female figure lighting the cigarette, whilst it might enforce traditional ideas of female roles like nursing assigned to women, paradoxically, also um, in function to highlight the destabling of impact of war by making evident that on the home front there was a highly visible presence of large numbers of his disabled and permanent and men with injuries or permanent disables, dis disabilities, all of whom were to some degree reliant on other people for support. In the painting, the vulnerable position of injured and disabled men is not just suggested by the male figure's demeanour, it is also indicated by the choice of power that is bestowed on the female figure has been given the decision of allowing the man to have his cigarette or not, simply by lighting it. As a result, rather than simply celebrating the selfish heroism of voluntary enlisted men and nurses fighting for freedom and, look, and the cause, the choice of lighting the cigarette can be seen to enforce notions of masculine de dependency and female authority. Consequences, the way in which gender has been inscribed in Dorman's painting can be interpreted as suggesting endorsement of the destabilising effects of war upon the traditional stratification of British society by, on the basis of gender. Another artist whose works suggest the impact on traditional concepts of gender is Richard Nevinson. Um, by the way in which femininity is described, inscribed in his painting War Profiteers, 
which was exhibited at his second solo exhibition at the Leicester Galleries in March 1918. Um, Though the painting is called Profiteers here, it also has an alternative title as War Profiteers, which is why I'll refer to it as that throughout this. Two female figures stand against the background of a city street at night in wartime. Denoted as such by the way in which the figures, cars, shops and in the painting's background are illuminated by an unnatural blue light that is emit em emitted from the triangular coloured rays, shaped rays of anti-enemy searchlights. Two female figures have been dressed in fashionable clothing of the kind advertised in magazines that place great emphasis upon social aspirations of the readers, such as the Queen. The female figure on the left, for example, is dressed in a heavy um, red winter-coloured coat. There's a fine fur collar which has been rendered dark brown or black in pigments, suggesting luxury, perhaps the fur of either an American mink or muskrat. These were species of animals prized and farmed commercially for their fur that was and still is used in the manufacture of either whole items of clothing, such as coats or trimmings for garments. Moreover, as magazines indicate, fur coats and fur trimmings were in 1917, the year in which Nevinson's painting was produced, considered to be cherished adornments. Caught in the enemy's spotlight, however, rather than simply implying good taste or social status, the opulence of the clothing and accessories worn by the two figures implied a spectacle of prolific excess at a time of austerity. This allowed the paintings to suggest that the figures represented individuals who were perhaps profiting from war, for example, as the wives, daughters or mistresses of industrialists who were making money from profiting, female munitions workers perceived by many people to be earning high wages, or prostitutes living near to battle earning money more directly um, from the war. Nevinson certainly didn't have to look very far for inspiration for the theme of war profiteering. As Adrian Gregory has noted, profits generated by the demand for goods such as munitions and overinflated prices of foodstuffs blamed on shortages caused by war meant that by 1917 profiteering had become not only a central concept of discourse of the war but also a wide term of abuse directed towards individuals for example women like this wearing expensive clothing and companies such as those making munitions who either appeared to be or were undoubtedly fi benefiting financially from the war in addition to what can be understood as a tactless display of excessive wealth implied by the expensive clothing of the female figures, public distaste for war profiteering is also suggested in Nevinson's painting by the handling of line and pigment. <coughs> Nevinson's economy of line and chiaroscuro effect of contrasting dark and light tones achieved um, with pigment used to reproduce the effects of the searchlight hitting the facial features of the two women is operated to render their made-up faces mask-like to the point of making them appear grotesque. To this end, as an article in the Westminster Gazette noticed, the way in which femininity has been constructed in the painting has the effect of implying that figures in the painting represent a coarse and clearly repulsive young women. Therefore, playing on the common association of femininity with beauty and art, representing two grotesque-looking figures, Nevinson's painting functions to inspire beholders with feelings of repulsion. Whilst public taste at the tactless injustice of war profiteering provides an indication as to what might have inspired Nevinson's painting, it doesn't explain why the artist decided to symbolise war profiteers using two female figures. Alan Franson has noticed that during the war, the legacy of war and sexual difference being seen as de reciprocal definers of each other enabled masculine complicity in war-related death in industry to be mitigated through interpretation as an act of self-sacrificial patriotism, a rite of passage towards an individual's manliness. Franzner's suggestion is borne out by the reverential respect for in uh, justified reverential respect for injured servicemen. Um, expressed in things like Isaac's le uh, letter and also um, the creditors by Dolman. In contrast, with the exception of nursing the wounded, the legacy of war and sexual difference determined that there was little precedent for the active participation of women in war. Indeed, opposite was the case, the way in which women were frequently identified as prizes in victory to provide raise and detriment for enlistment in much war propaganda, functioned to imply that women were in part to blame for the male in in injury and death toll. 
Um, this is made only too evident by the way in which femininity is shown in the painting. In Nevinson's painting, whilst the figure on the right is shown wearing a seamlessly innocuous triangular shaped hat, the figure on the left wears a hat decorated with an elaborately centrally placed white feather. White feather worn on the hat allows the painting to allude to the practice of handing out white feathers to shame men into voluntary enlistment. On the 30th, 30th of August 1914, Admiral Charles Penrose Fitzgerald succeeds in persuading 30 women in Folkestone to hand out white feathers to men of military service age not in uniform. The purpose of this action, which soon spread beyond Folkestone, was to induce enlistment through um, enforcing manliness with chivalric conduct which not only defined through physical and psychological strength, but equal to an individual's display of loyalty and patriotism. On this basis, the handing out of white feathers informed men who were deaf, deaf or indifferent to the country's need for services, recruitment, that there is a danger awaiting them far more terrible than they can meet in battle. The danger that men were predicted to face was, was worse than injury on, on the battlefield, being was that being publicly humiliated and branded unpatriotic cowards for non-enlistment by recipient of a white feather. As the war progressed, the practice of handing out white feathers to coerce men into voluntary enlistment was increasingly understood as being an act of dangerous warmongering um, and a sign of female complicity in masculine injury and death toll. The distribution of white feathers became increasingly discredited because of mistakes had been made whereby feathers had been handed out erroneously to men who were wounded, permanently disabled, or on leave from the battlefront or in exempt professions. Demonstrating this point, the Imperial War Museum, as we probably know, has a massive um, oral out, um, recording of people who gave their accounts of the First World War during the 1960s, um, which was recorded by the BBC. And one of those tells the story of a disabled serviceman who was on a tram in 1917 who was given a white feather by a woman. Um, he basically says that I stood up and stuck my stump in the woman's face. All she did was run off the tram. Um, However, the, ero the context of war and injury and the erroneous handing out allowed feathers to be viewed as women's guilty em emblem in the complicity of the promotion of war. Um, thereby, allusions to the handing out of white feathers in the painting can be understood to indicate female support for enlistment, albeit often induced by propaganda, made women indirectly complicit in the massive death toll. In addition to being prizes of victory and involvement in the flawed handing out of distribute of white feathers, the production of weapons of mass destruction by women working in the munitions industry also served to imply that femininity could be considered complicit in the loss of life. This was a position that was remorsefully acknowledged by female munitions workers themselves and was made evident in the letter by one of them, who stated, the fact that I'm using my life's energy to destroy human souls gets on my nerves. Yet on the other hand, I'm doing what I can to bring this horrible affair to an end. But once the war is over, never in creation will I do the same thing again. Moreover, commenting about public opinion on employees in the munitions industry, another former munitions worker observed, munitions workers were just about the lowest form of life in the eyes of the general public. We were supposed to make a great deal of money, and other people didn't make so much, so they called us all sorts of things, even shouted after us, if they knew what you were, they had all sorts of nasty things to say to you. Foregoing accounts that indicate that while some individuals might have been slightly better off financially, Many women found the experience of working in the munitions industry highly unpleasant. Women also, in addition to finding unpleasant, risked their own lives and health. Um, a number of women were killed as a result of explosions in the factories, as a result of shells going off, but also roughly there were 50 deaths a year of toxic jaundice caused by filling shells with TNT. Um, toxic jaundice was characteristic of yellow skin, hair and teeth that dyed the body. Um, although the um, deaths were censored by the Defence of the Realm Act, um, the effects of it were difficult to conceal. Um, as um, one factory worker noticed, noted, it was quite a 12 months after we left the factory that the whole of the yellow came from our bodies. Washing it wouldn't do anything, it only made it worse. So essentially, basically, people knew if you worked in the munitions factory because, you, like disabled servicemen, you had your role in the war written on your body by the colour of your skin. Um, the long period that it took bodies to recover from toxic jaundice meant that filling shells with TNT um, obviously made the position very obvious that what these women were doing. 
Um, it led to the women being called um, canaries after the pet canary birds who had feathers of the same thing. So women obviously also had to wrestle with their conscience. They didn't really want to be blamed for playing a role in the war. They wanted, like the servicemen, to try and bring the war to an end. Um, and they also had to make a living to support their families. Um, However, as the account of Mary Beth Robertson above indicates, women who undertook employment in the man munitions industry to support the war effort and help their own families were often treated as if they were profiting no less immorally from war as business businesses selling ration goods at inflation prices and industrialists making a fortune from the sale of armaments. Um, this allowed se seemingly greater authority during wartime to be understood as having antisocial or immoral dimensions. Um, demonstrating this point in, the, uh, in a similar way to the use of figures in um, the war properties, an article in the University of Birmingham magazine um, published during that time called The Real Danger of March 1915 noted women's sordid desires have been the cause of all misery of the world from the sweating of employees to procure her wealth to the torture of animals to procure her adornment. Woman is striving to win political and economic power and strength with greater fierceness. Therefore, drawing upon prevailing beliefs that female munitions, munitions workers earned high wages and the wives, daughters and mistresses of which industrious profited from war at the expense of servicemen, war profiteers can be understood to highlight and perhaps encourage the generation of negative opinions to war women. To conclude, the demarcation of roles by sexual differences in pre-war British society meant that femininity was often interpreted as being synonymous with pacifism. This was a, a key strength for um, the women's um, suffrage movement. Um, and aggression and heroic bravery in war were understood to be desired masculine attributes. However, the unprecedented circumstances of war temporarily destabled this long-held balance of masculinity and femininity. This made it very difficult for pre-war values to continue to be upheld in all cultural forms. Older concepts of gender caused by the effects of war meant that not just being understood as masculine heroism in the face of terrible adversity of war, images such as that of the credit is, um, could also be interpreted as promoting the reversal of pre-war value, as suggesting masculine weakness um, um, as a, and feminine increased authority. Um, this allowed claims to be engendered amongst disillusioned combatants that civilians, especially women, were profiting from war at the expense of servicemen. It's helped to foster ideas of a gender and geographical divide between wartime experience and the predominantly female home front on the British Isles and the exclusively masculine home fronts abroad of the battle front, sorry, battle fronts. Um, this reveals the way in which the devastating effects of war affected gender. However, it's a temporary thing. And basically, after the First World War, in the immediate aftermath, we get all these men coming back to come home. There is a need to reintegrate these men into British society. One of the key ways in which this is done is to revert to pre-war war values. Although some women do get the vote in 1918, um, it's a very limited number of women. Um, and so, in many ways, a lot of these women who found themselves more prosperous and gaining jobs, etc., lost that power and had to give up their jobs again. Um, the war did perhaps make things slightly easier for the promotion of feminine ideas and femini feminism to go onwards, but in the immediate afterwards, it created the idea of a cult of the um, legacy of the injured servicemen. And this was inspired seems to have inspired the canon of British war art to do the same. This is also enshrined by the collection of the Imperial War Museum, which seems to have followed the idea of the basis of war and sexual difference as a definer. 99.9% .9 of the collection of the Imperial War Museum's collection of fine art is of the masculine perspective on the battlefront. The Imperial War Museum accepts this. There's nothing it can do about this now retrospectively, apart from buying more examples of work. But of course, it's limited by funds. However, it appears that this idea that war is predominantly a masculine idea fought on the battlefront, although it's been addressed in later war art, certainly in the Second World War onwards and more le recent uh, events sort of like Iraq and Afghanistan in official war art, the First World War canon has remained rigidly almost stuck to the masculine perspective. This, I suggest, is one, the result of this division of sexual difference, and two, 
has inspired the canon to continue like this until only very recently when people have started to revise and question it. And certainly I think this is the idea that certain works that showed an abnormal position of gender hierarchies during the First World War was seen as abnormal and overlooked in the sort of enshrining period that happened after the First World War. And this has continued until very recently. Thank you.